Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. During the season of Advent, we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. As you know, Emmanuel is simply the Hebrew word for God with us. And that is what we desire, for God to be with us, for God to come to us, or better yet, for we to be with God. For we have been cut off from God. The curse of our sin has made us exiles in the world. We have been parted from the one who is truly our home, thrown out of the garden. We pray to be delivered from the isolation, delivered from the loneliness and the emptiness of life. Our entire eschatological goal of Christianity and the, the crux of, of Western thought revolves around this restoration of the perfect communion with He who is to come, riding upon the clouds, our Lord Savior, when He returns. But Christ didn't first appear at Christmas. I know popular Christianity sort of teaches that, that Jesus came at Christmas. Cultural Christianity gives us the impression that Jesus was not, and then poof, Christmas, and Jesus showed up. It's actually a heresy. It's called Arianism. But when will that stop pop Christianity or cultural Christianity? They're commonly wrong. Mostly because their leaders have better things to do with their time than, you know, I don't know, read theology. They're too busy practicing their guitar solos, probably. We are too tempted to fall into this hole. To think for some reason that, that the, the Son of God wasn't really doing that much. That before his conception and birth into the world and coming at Christmas, that Jesus was just sort of missing, absent. Sleeping, and he just sort of shows up at the beginning works of the New Testament and goes, Hey, Dad, I'm here. I'm ready for work now. The whole idea of Jesus not being in the Old Testament is kind of foreign. Jesus is all over the New Testament. In fact, in the Old Testament as well. The Son of God was intimately involved with his people in very, from the very beginning. Scripture tells us that all things were created through he who was and who was to come. Christ, the Son of God, appears to his chosen people in a pre-incarnate form many times. He comes to be with his people Israel. He comes to speak with his people Israel. He comes to guide them. He comes to deliver them from his enemies. All of this is a precursor to the time when Christ would descend and be made man in order to dwell permanently with man. Last week, we saw how Christ came to earth, came to Moses in a burning bush. Today, we encounter Israel after the exodus, traveling in the wilderness, and God's presence is with his people, and God's presence is there in the form of a cloud. And that cloud leads them during the day and guards them in the night, and at times, descends upon the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle is really just a mobile tent. It's a mobile temple. It was a tent used for worship, used for meeting. It had a most holy place. The ark was set in it. And on top of the, car, the ark was the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was where God sat. Where he, the Lord himself was present to meet with his people through the sacrificial system. Even as God was present in the pillar by night, by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So when the clouds rose off of the temple and moved, Israelite just followed the cloud. And when the cloud remained on the temple, the people would stay. My point is this is the presence of the Lord God in the wilderness. This is the presence of the second person of the Trinity. This was Christ, their Savior, and yours. It's St. John who reminds us that no one has ever seen God, but that Christ, the only begotten of, of God, is the revealing of God. In the cloud, as it traveled through the wilderness, the presence of our Savior was there. 
their Messiah, their Christ, our Messiah, our Christ. It is the Creator entering in to the creation for the benefit of His people to lead them to the riches of the promised land. A living prophecy of how heaven and earth would come together. John teaches us those very important words. That is, the Word, the Son of God, that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That dwelling is from the Hebrew word to tabernacle, so it would be very easy for us to translate that. The Word of God, the Son of God, became flesh and tabernacled with us. This is, this is what Jesus did in the Old Testament. He literally tented with his people in the wilderness and led them day by day. Jesus Christ has done the same thing unto us. He has come in the flesh and dwelt with his people. That same Lord who dwelt with the people in a, in a tent made of animal skins has taken on human nature and the glory of the Lord's dwelling, the human skin and the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the tabernacling that Jesus descended to fill is our own human bodies and souls. But he didn't just do so for a small amount of time. You see, Jesus did this. Jesus took on human flesh for all of eternity. It is a permanent dwelling with humanity. In the wilderness, the cloud would sometimes rise off of the tabernacle, but in Christ, the divine humanity and the natures of humanity are, are combined together. They are, are joined together. In Christ, the divine and human natures are joined eternally. So that the God, the Son, is always and will always be not just only true God, but also true man, our brother. This is what Jesus means when he tells the Pharisees, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Because just as Jesus dwelled with Israel in the wilderness in the tent, he's dwelling with the people in his flesh. God and man comes together. So that all humanity might be raised to the glory of God, Jesus is himself that glory of God full of grace and truth. This is why Christmas is such a joyous time for us, because it celebrates this very reality that although we have been separated from God by our sins, Jesus, through his incarnation, has crossed that canyon that we couldn't have gotten over. He has bridged that gap between heaven and earth, and through Jesus' human nature as Christ, we have been reconciled, and God and man have literally and literally been united in the person of the second, the second part of the Trinity. We see this fellowship foreshadowed in a cloud, which should not be surprising unto us. We see a cloud in Jesus' ministry all over the place. Clouds are always, in the New Testament, connected to Jesus. Jesus reveals his glory to his disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah come in a cloud, and a cloud overshadows them. The same thing can be said when Jesus ascends into heaven. He ascends into heaven, and then the cloud hides Jesus' form from the disciples' sight. And what are clouds made of? Water. Jesus' presence is for us in baptism to make our bodies a temple, a tabernacling of the Holy Spirit of God. Through water and the Word. It's also written that Jesus will come in the clouds with great power and great glory to bring the redemption of his people unto a fulfillment. Revelation chapter 21 describes the fulfillment of our Advent hope. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore for the former, former things have passed away. There will be no more isolation, no more exile, no more wilderness, no more wandering, no more social distancing. And we will experience the fullness of the Lord God's name in Emmanuel, God with Therefore, as we prepare for the Advent season, both for Christmas and also as we prepare for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us be like the children of Israel, traveling with the cloud of the tabernacle. Let us be patient and let us follow his leading as the Lord leads over the world, through the grave, into the resurrection, and into the life to come.
as he has led us through baptism. In Jesus' name.